thanks very much for inviting me to uh, chat to your student chapter today. I think um, my topic today is going to be on climate change and how that's impacting public transit systems, namely in Canada, but we'll speak to the, it's happening everywhere in the world. So the cases I'm going to talk about are relevant in other countries as well. And basically, we're going to cover how can you adapt your public transit systems to kind of combat against some of these impacts from climate change. So, you want to know a bit about the firm I work for? My name is Nick Roberts, and I work at CPCS. So, we're a consulting firm that specializes in transportation and infrastructure projects. The CP actually stands for Canadian Pacific, like the freight railroad, and we're a consulting division of that railway way back in the day, and we've broken off since, and now we're an employee-owned firm with about 150 staff worldwide, a lot of projects in Canada, US, and I'd say about half of our business too is overseas in various countries across Africa, some work in the Middle East and Asia as well. And we have global groups that focus on everything from public-private partnerships, advising on those, how our sector work, public transportation, freight transportation, all kinds of infrastructure like that. And myself, I'm a mechanical engineer from the University of Waterloo, so thanks for the hospitality today. I know I'm not a U of T alum, but um, then I studied a master's degree in finance and management over in Europe, and I've been working in consulting for about seven years, mainly in this space as well. So the question today is, how should uh, public transit systems improve their resilience to climate change and how? So I'll cover a little bit on what resilience is, first of all. Like resilience is really like a system's ability to bounce back from something negative happening. So say there was one of those atmospheric rivers out west, a lot of rain came down, flooded a section of the railroad track, or it got washed out, it's like resilience is a, how, like, how strong that railway can be built to resist that in the first place, and then also the time to recover it back to its operational state after that flood happens. Like the earthquake in Japan where they could just start the trains the next day or something? Yeah, so that would be a highly resilient system. But all of that comes at a cost. Uh, you're absolutely right, and we'll get to that, because you're building out like more robust infrastructure at a much higher cost to protect it against these severe weather events, which you're not certain if they're going to occur or to what extent. So you're putting in a lot of money up front to kind of shore up your infrastructure and protect it against things which may or may not happen in the future. But I think climate change is very real. Uh, there's definitely disruptions happening. It's just to what scale and what's the cost of that impact to your system. We worked on a study at CPCS, and we did a bunch of literature reviews, so reading reports from governments and public transit agencies, and that can kind of highlight what are the big climate trends happening across Canada, and also find out what transit agencies are doing to protect their systems against those trends. And then also we did stakeholder engagement, so we spoke to a variety of transit agencies, coast to coast, big ones, small ones, some in between, and that operate a mix of like bus, uh, light rail transit, subways, the long distance passenger rail, like the BIA trains that go from Toronto all the way to Vancouver and out east as well. So make sure that we've got a good mix of a, the operating environment and the transit assets that they have to see how how is climate impacting those in different ways? So we took those insights and combined them together, and that's how we came up with our study. So, first question, what do we mean by resilience? We covered that already uh, in brief. So it's really um, the ability to bounce back from the disruption, and it means planning for climate risks. So in our study, we talked about climate stressors, which is something that triggers a risk. So intense rainfall would be a stressor. If you have a lot of intense rain come down in a short period of time, there's a risk of flooding and something bad happening. Same thing with high temperatures. If it's 
heat wave for a long period of time, the risk is like a blackout, a lot of stress on the electrical grid, or that uh, wildfires can spark a lot easier, and then you have air quality side effects from that. So we have a, a long list there of what are all the different climate stressors and some examples of risks, and really like your risk mitigation, how you protect your systems against these stressors, it goes back to understanding like what's happening in the climate and in your public transit system. So a couple of examples of different stressors, we'll go through these. Unfortunately, you may be aware that uh, Canada's climate is warming at roughly double the global average, especially out west and in northern parts of the country. So that's exposing uh, systems to a lot of risk. We, the result of these higher temperatures is more high intensity rainfall, melting permafrost, which is up north where the ground is usually frozen solid all year long. That's melting now and is becoming a bit more mushy for lack of a better word. And that affects the stability of things that are built on top of the permafrost. And then uh, the next one, another couple of examples is with all of this higher temperatures, higher moisture content in the air, it's giving rise to a lot more kind of severe weather, like thunderstorms. Like earlier this week, we're all here, probably experienced some loud thunder and lightning in the GTA. That's one of the hot spots for thunderstorms in Canada. And all of that, like you need to build out infrastructure to be protected more against lightning strikes and power outage risks. And then also, there's, we don't see it often, but the risk of hail coming down, which those big ice pellets, and those can cause a lot of damage as well. Another stressor, we talked about heat. Uh, so that's the risk of wildfires. Uh, this past summer, we saw that out west, a lot of those wildfires sparking led to big air quality issues all the way across Canada into the US, and some of it even migrated across over to Europe. So this chart here is showing from the Calgary airport how many hours of smoke, they're gonna be called smoke hours, they have seen each year. And basically the main takeaway is a huge spike at the end, which is basically where we are now. So it's becoming more problematic. And of course, poor air quality not only impacts like your physical assets in the transit system, like ventilation on board buses and subway trains and that, but also the health risks of people who are working to operate those vehicles and also the comfort for passengers who are on board the transit vehicles. So, uh, another example here is, despite it getting hotter in general, there's uh, more kind of erratic weather patterns. We have these polar vortex or cold snaps where large masses of Arctic air moves down south. So there is still a risk of severe, very cold weather temperatures, which can impact like the structural integrity of some components that are used on transit systems, like track for railways. To, and cold weather, like the steel, can become brittle, subject to cracking. And there's kinds of regulations that are used for like, mitigating that if you're operating trains in cold weather conditions. So those are. Examples in Canada, but of course, you know, we're global, and th these these problems are not unique to Canada. Like I mentioned, CPCS does a lot of work in Africa. Africa's got a lot of climate change impacts that are impacting their public transit systems as well. There's a few shown on this slide, and really, just similar to Canada, they're both vast geographic regions. So climate change issues in one region could be very different from another. Like if you're a major city located on the coast, the risk of like hurricanes or like, uh, ocean like storm surge, which is when the water swells up and can flood inland, that's more relevant to them rather than more inland, which if you're up near the Sahara region, dust storms and heat waves and that could be more problematic for those types of systems. So I'll just say, uh, summarizing the climate stressors that we look at, basically all of them are, are going up, except for the snow and the cold, which are going down. But again, subject to those irregular weather patterns, it still might be a, a concern. 
um, these stressors, they vary in frequency and severity, so how often they may occur and how like, severe or how bad the weather is. Um, there's, we see growing populations everywhere, a lot of people moving to urban centers and that. So that places more stress on public transit systems to be able to handle a, the increase in population, but also disruptions that may happen from climate change as well. So we have mitigation in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions that are going into the atmosphere, which is great. A lot of shift to like electric buses, electric vehicles and that. But there's another side of it, which is looking at adaptation. So how to improve the infrastructure that's there. So what does climate change mean for public transit systems? In general, public transit systems are pretty complex. They're made up of a whole bunch of different assets which have different risk profiles. You have buildings like stations, garages for transit fleets, linear infrastructure, which are like roadways, tracks, bridges, uh, the human side of things, and all of the like supporting electrical and communications equipment. So again, like, each of these are, have different vulnerabilities to different types of risks. So if you're a transit agency, you need to really understand what are all the components of making your system work and how vulnerable are they to different types of climate and weather related events. So here I'm gonna run through some examples of we talked about like precipitation is increasing. What does this mean for a transit system? So there's risks of more like flooding and washout of roads, bridges, and other linear infrastructure, water getting into kind of subterranean structures, so like subway tunnels and the electrical components that are uh, beneath ground. Um, loss of traction, so this picture there up in the top right, that's a picture of the Ottawa LRT operating in the snow, and there have been issues with traction and like, those trains operating in winter. Uh, they're fed by like overhead electrical power lines, and if you have freezing rain, you can, ice can build up on those wires, and that restricts like how much electricity is getting to power the vehicles. There can be issues with it operating in freezing rain conditions. And then, this is a little while back now, but there was an instance in the Donlands in Toronto where a GO train got stuck, and it got flooded, and passengers had to get evacuated off of the train. Using boats. No, no, I don't I remember, I remember both, that. Yeah. I remember we that on, on the, the news. Train, no I wasn't on the train, but some people on the top deck, mm -hmm. or like the lower deck, were evacuated using Toronto Police Service inflatable boats. Which, <laughs> you just normally don't call the Marine no. unit to evacuate a coach trip. I know, that's <laughs> unexpected. <laughs> so, one issue there was like, this train was as heading into a, a flood plain from an area, so very low land, oh, yeah. very close to the river and that. Well, the, and Do the Don River, like the, this this line is the Richmond Hill line, so it goes yeah. parallel to the Don River. Yeah. It's, it's one of the lowest parts in Toronto, so it is kind of... Mm -hmm. So one of the mitigations is that they install, well, they, they can install like detection systems, like water level detection systems, uh, out from the track, so you'd be able to see if water, flood water is encroaching on where the track is. In this instance, there wasn't something quite like that, so it was too late. By the time that the train was already heading into that region, they weren't able to halt the train or reverse it, and then ultimately got stuck in the flood waters. I, I heard that that's like the Metro doesn't think it would happen again because they would route the trains by, by the barrier line or something mm -hmm. instead to avoid the flood area. Yeah, that's a good point, but they still need to know that the, the area is flooded, right? right? But you're right, that's a contingency measure, and we'll get to that. It's like, if something like this happens, if your transit network is flexible and you can reroute either buses or trains, it's much easier to reroute a bus, but you're right, you can avoid the hazard that occurs. Because the people still want to get home. Yes. You know, they're, they're always like, like the idea of, oh, I'm going to sleep in my office tonight. Mm -hmm. Yes, question people? Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious about how good the resolution is on like, the predictions that um, like, climate scientists give for, let's say, the future effects. Like, is it good enough that you can actually plan for 
100 more milliliters of rain and you know, it could be 50 or you just know that it's going to rain more but you don't know how much it's going to rain. Good point. I'm not quite sure on that. I won't be able to comment on the accuracy of those climate models but one thing that we have seen is uh, if you're planning infrastructure like stormwater drainage like culverts and that to divert water away from tracks or roads there's been a bit of a revisit. Like before, a lot of these systems were planned for one in a hundred year type of events. So you have like a 1% chance that this type of severe uh, precipitation and flood could happen. And now they're revisiting that to be like a one in 50 year event. So they're planning for something like that would occur more frequently, more severe. So that means that they have to build like the culverts a bit bigger, improve the drainage system, maybe like oversize it a bit to accommodate those events, and all of that comes as additional costs. A lightning strike? Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of buildings are protected with lightning protection so if a, if a lightning strike were to hit the building rather than getting I guess conducted through the building and all the electrical systems this is like an insulative rod so the lightning strike would hit this rod and get down to the ground if you didn't have that lightning protection you run the risk that like the power would get knocked out or the circuits in your building would get fried so if you were a transit garage you would lose all of the power in that garage, or if, say, you were the operational station for a transit agency, you would lose power and not be able to, to like dispatch buses and dispatch trains and things like that. And also, if you think you're moving towards like an electrified like electric bus fleet, you've got that power outage that happened, you're not able to charge your buses, you're not able to get them on the road again. So that's why... I, we're getting a bigger reliance on electrical systems as we move towards electric buses and even all of the trains that are going in across the country, like Eglinton, Finch West. So we're going to see that the electrical components are a bigger risk now. Not only from the lightning, but from heat, mainly from like the heat waves. And that. So we'll get heat. The, uh, the next one we can talk about, what are some of the effects that heat causes to transit systems. This picture up here at the top right is track. And you might be able to see a little wiggle in the track, which is not good. Basically what happens in hot weather is the, the track will expand, it's a metal, it's going to expand and push against each other and it will warp out of alignment and that risks like trains derailing and going off of the track. So interestingly, to protect against that, one of the things that Metrolinx has done is they have revised the temperature at which the track gets installed in the first place. So you can imagine if, if the track was installed at like say 10 degrees Celsius and it warms up to 40, there's a huge thermal expansion that could happen. But if the track is installed at like 30 degrees Celsius and it warms to 40, that's a much less temperature change. So there's less risk of this type of track warpage happening. Does that create risks then if with temperatures in the other direction? So like if you if you installed it at 20 room temperature, but then you've got a negative 20 evening, mm -hmm. do you, you know, do you start I guess it would, ex does the track start like contracting like crazy? <laughs> well, that's a good point. <laughs> I, I'm not, I won't be able to speak to all the details of that, but in extreme cold weather conditions, the track can get brittle, which means it's subject to having cracks in it. So what Transport Canada mandates is like the freight trains, which put a lot of weight on them, they actually have to slow their speed. So the track has got more time to like bend and deflect the trains are going over top of it in the cold weather. So you're right, on the other end of the spectrum, there is a trade-off, and Canada's climate is so different, like from north to south, yeah. that I don't know if you could use Metrolinx's standard 
across the entire country. Oh, you're saying about for like metrolinks, because like, like with a with a passenger train, mm -hmm. if you had to change your schedules every every cold day, it would kind of be a, a bit inconvenient. You know what I mean? Because the way things would cascade, if you if you're delaying, if trains are slowing down by a certain amount, and then it arrives five minutes later at Union Station, it leaves Union Station five minutes later. Everything's shifted. You know what yeah. I mean? I think that cold weather one is more um, is more relatable to the freight trains. Okay. But there is, of course, an interaction between freight and passenger trains. In Canada, they run on the same tracks, like CN and CP Rail. The freight companies own a lot of the railways. So if you get into a condition where you're on a via rail train, they may have to slow down because the freight trains have to slow down. There's right. a lot more interaction between via and the freight trains than there is between metro links and the freight trains. Yeah, because metro links is on a lot of track. That's why yeah. they don't run so reliably. Mm -hmm. Good. So like, you talked about cold. This is a cold weather slide. So you have run some risks, like I said, about that brittle failure, like structural cracks in track. There's also a risk of like switches which move back and forth to like move your trains from one track to another track those could seize up i don't know if you've seen at all when it gets really cold out like chicago has got like the railway is on fire but that's basically because they're using gas fired heaters to defrost those switches so the trains can continue to operate and then of course with like electric buses there's a risk of reduced operating range for the vehicles cold weather as like more energy is being used to like heat the cabin the passengers are things like that so that was a, a picture at the bottom is an electric bus in winnipeg winnipeg's pretty cold so they were traveling those buses back in the day and then seasonal temperature changes I mentioned about permafrost which was traditionally like rock solid frozen ground um, now in the north, we're seeing a lot of issues with melting permafrost, and uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but a couple of years back, there's a rail line that runs up to northern Manitoba, and that delivers passenger service, and for a lot of the smaller rural and remote communities, they're highly dependent on that passenger railway. There's not many other options for them to, to do transportation. so. Because of the melting permafrost, a lot of big section of that track actually got kind of eroded or washed away and needed to get repaired. That's an image at the top. And then of course with this freeze and thaw, like you can have potholes, risks of spring flooding and train derailment and that. So kind of the things that are happening. And then in the severe storms, it was not this winter, but last winter there was a tree that fell down and stranded some passengers on board a via train. So there's risks of high winds and that blowing debris onto the right of way, which can impact transit vehicles being able to get from A to B. Uh, lightning strikes and hail, as we mentioned, and impaired visibility. So if you have like a big intense rainstorm or a blizzard happening, that can affect the visibility for the transit operators to safely operate the vehicles. And out on the coasts, there's risks of storm surge and sea level rise. So if you have these intense wave actions against uh, roads and railways that are built near to the coast, that can cause flooding or washout, as well as you know, we're dealing with seawater. So metal and well, mainly steel and seawater doesn't mix too well. There's risks of it corroding, which means that these components need to get replaced inspected and replaced more often. So those are all the climate trends, but on the other side of things, our public transit systems are not staying the same. There's changes in them that are happening, which is causing greater like, vulnerabilities as well in certain areas. One is this electrification. So there's a greater link between Tendencies on the electrical grid and being able to deliver your transit service. And also, the battery electric buses and that tend to be heavier vehicles. And there's a relationship between like, vehicle weight and road damage. 
So you're going to have a lot more heavier vehicles operating, bigger risk for potholes and need for maintaining the road. So there's also a lot of number of um, passenger rail projects that are becoming electric. There's work on electrifying the GO service and also a bunch of light rail transit projects happening across mainly southern Ontario. Those are all powered by electricity. Um, so another thing is public-private partnerships. So those are often used to deliver transit projects, building new ones and that. And of course, if you're a contractor and you're going to say build out a new railway or, or LRT system, these projects take a long time. I'm sure you might be aware. And if you are expecting certain costs for building that piece of infrastructure, that may not account for future changes in the climate, which might make it more costly to build your infrastructure or maintain it in the future. So there's kind of that dynamic to see how can that risk of climate change be shared by the two contracting parties. Also like insurance risks, so like if something does happen, who's at fault for how much and things like that. And that picture is a high-speed rail in California, which is getting built they're only working on the phase one right now. It's going to take a long time to pull up a million in projects in that to connect basically the Bay Area to Southern California and that. So that's an example of a really long duration project, which there needs to be like a lens on risk sharing between public and private entities. Uh, another thing to look at too is transit systems are often used to respond to climate. Uh, climate emergency, climate events. So when they had wildfires up in Fort McMurray in Alberta, there was a bunch of transit buses from the local transit agencies that were used to evacuate people from those northern communities that were impacted by the wildfires. And also TransLink, which is the agency out in Vancouver, uh, in the heat wave conditions, they actually used their bus fleet portion of that for moving kind of vulnerable populations, like the elderly and that, uh, people without air conditioning to kind of cooling centers. So there's that dynamic of uh, using your public transit systems to help in these types of events as well. So we kind of looked at that long list of what were all of the climate risks and stressors that were happening and funneled it down to what we kind of thought were the, the top couple. And we thought that the extreme heat and intense precipitation, those seem to be the top of mind concerns for transit agencies because it's happening kind of on a wide geographic scale happening across, uh, across countries, across Canada and that, and both of them are projected to increase in severity and frequency, whereas some of the other ones, like I mentioned, is the permafrost melts, a storm surge and that, they could be highly impactful, but they are in specific geographic regions, whereas the heat and the precipitation tend to be across Canada. So what do we need to do to adapt differently? Uh, looking at risk, risk is basically a, a product of vulnerability, so how vulnerable is that asset? So an example is a diesel bus versus an electric bus. An electric bus would be much more vulnerable to heat-related power grid disruptions than a diesel bus would, because you need it for charging your vehicles. And then, uh, so that's the vulnerability side. On the criticality is like how critical is that asset for you delivering your transit service? Uh, a rail line, would be much more critical than a bus because transit agencies say they have hundreds of buses. They often keep spare buses in case one breaks down. So it's much easier to swap in and out assets. Whereas a rail line, like a lot of the light rail trains, they need to operate on that rail line. So if there's a disruption that really impacts your service. So climate change adaption is really taking action to reduce the vulnerability of these systems to actual or expected changes in the climate. And then, as I talked a little 
little bit about before, you've kind of got two things happening which is impacting the risk profiles of transit systems. One is the assets themselves are changing. So you have a lot of aging infrastructure like bridges or roads or that that need to get rehabilitated. And like the Garden Expressway project, so there's a lot of works going on on that. That would be an example of that case. And uh, system electrification with the buses or say hydrogen fuel cell buses coming in as well, which all have different risk profiles. And then on the other side, you have the environmental conditions which are changing. And that uh, gives rise to different um, risks for transit systems. So what can we do? Um, the first section is hardening or protecting infrastructure. So this is like using different materials or different designs, more robust designs, kind of build up the systems stronger or using kind of detection mechanisms to early detect the hazards that might be happening and take action to uh, mitigate against them. So on that one picture up there, we talked about the GO train flooding. That's one of the sensors. This detects rock fall hazards. So if there was rocks that slid down and were obstructing the track, this thing would be able to uh, detect that. It's like a laser beam that shoots across the track. So if it gets broken, then you know that there's hazards up ahead. And then that way, uh, the passengers... Those systems are so fascinating. Yeah, the trains can be know, appropriately managed until the hazards are out of the way. And the bottom one is just a picture of a bunch of big culverts getting installed to manage the, the drainage risks of flooding. So that's one. There's a couple other examples listed up there as well. How to harden and protect infrastructure. Um, the other one here you mentioned was relocating infrastructure. So this is not necessarily temporary or permanent, in this case covering permanent relocation. Uh, that map there is from Amtrak, which is basically the equivalent of Via Rail in the United States. So that's their passenger rail service. What they're doing is in New York, they're mapping out areas which could be at high risk to flooding and they're looking to either like relocate stations or bits of track and that to kind of avoid those areas which could get high risk for floods. So that can involve elevating the track in areas which are kind of low-lying floodplains, relocate it more inland, or in the case of like electrical equipment and infrastructure, if it's out in the blazing heat and the sun, it could be a bigger risk for it failing. So moving it to more shaded areas or in buildings with better ventilation to keep those systems operating cool. And then the last area of adaptation measures is operating and maintenance adjustments. So it can be more frequent inspections and that or different mechanisms. We talked about the ice buildup on the catenary wires to clear off the ice, uh, clear off the track. There's this big snow blowing truck there that's used to clear the track in Edmonton for their light rail system. And another one is in the heat. Uh, in California, as an example, they have tensioning mechanisms. So when it gets hot, those catenary electrical wires tend to sag in the heat. And that's not good for the trains that are operating. So the tensioning mechanism really like turns and tightens up the wires them tight like a guitar string so that you don't have that risk of operating in hot weather conditions. And then of course another one is having backup power available to make sure that like, if your building suffers a power outage or that then you can still be able to run critical functions. So this kind of second to last slide here we talked about kind of a lot of things that could be done to uh, adapt for improved climate resiliency. Another one is procurement. So it's kind of this trade-off of like, do you spend more money up front to build resilient infrastructure for weather events that are gonna happen far into the future? You don't know to which degree or how severe, or how much that's gonna cost you. So in a lot of times it's hard to make the business case for spending that money up front. So if you're looking to have like a contractor come in to build a piece of infrastructure, 
often there's like minimum technical requirements that they have to meet, and then of course it gets to like price competition. So if, if you were looking to have more resilient infrastructure that comes at a higher cost, it's likely uh, not the case that you're going to go with a more expensive contractor to build it, right? So there needs to be a lens on your procurement approach to uh, take that into consideration. So I thought that this was kind of an interesting graphic. In the UK, it's a bit different setup than Canada. Uh, their rail is nationalized, but there's network rail owns all of the track. Well, it's pseudo-nationalized, pseudo mm -hmm. um, because technically speaking, network rail is a not-for-profit owned by yeah. the government. Mm -hmm. It's a long story, but they privatize their rail network. Yeah. which means that the operations are private. They tried to privatize the infrastructure rail track, mm -hmm. but that company was really bad at it. They actually had a couple of derailments, some people died, network rail took over. But because everything's privatized, there's payments for any sort of like damage to one or the other party. Because the way it works out is then private companies will bid to either have franchise with the government to run like a government mandated service, like yep. a commuter train in London, yeah. where they will have certain powers or schedule, but there's certain things that the government requires. It's, yep. it's a lawyer's field day. Yeah, that's what we're getting at here. So you say that you're absolutely right that the, there's concession agreements or like for passenger rails operators to run on the track that's owned by Network Rail or freight to run on the track. But in this case, they actually have a mechanism of paying to the operators if there was a, a weather-related delay. So in this case, it's kind of a financial mechanism that's used to make sure that the track is good operating state, kind of more robust and resilient to, to climate conditions so that they don't have to pay out these disruption costs to the operators that are running on the track. I thought that that was a bit of an interesting takeaway. So just to sum up here, uh, increased resilience comes at a cost, you know, unpredictable benefits because there's still some uncertainty on when and if, how bad climate uh, severe weather will happen and how badly it would impact <coughs> system. So that makes it a challenging business case to spend money up front to avoid future disruptions. There's really a lack of a standard methodology to go about trying to quantify this. And um, uh, another kind of part that plays into this is transit agencies also often face uh, financial shortcomings. A lot of them are struggling or have financial limitations. So really trying to just provide service and don't necessarily have excess capital for investing and making their infrastructure more resilient. You know, so we see that climate change is going to impact all public transit systems in one way or another, but we tend to see that the larger ones are more the first movers and have the resources, the know-how and financial resources and human power to help adapt better plan their infrastructure as well. So that takes to the end of my presentation. That's me, my contact details and CPCS, of course, glad to connect with you uh, if you want on LinkedIn or that. Thanks very much for the opportunity to present and if you've got any questions, I'll gladly take them right now. Even if it's not about the presentation, if it's about the company or consulting in general, Uh, the, the UK delay arbitration thing can be funny because there's some there's been some funny disputes like Network Rail and a rail operator just talked about had a dispute over whether a peacock was a big bird because if it's a big bird on the line it's the infrastructure owner's fault if it's a small bird it's the railway operator's fault if there's a delay <laughs> so is it a big bird. <laughs> <laughs>